Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Ed Jurechen. I'm the founding director of the Baker Institute, and I want to warmly welcome you to Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy this evening uh, for a, uh, I believe, a unique event examining the period of great conflict, revolution, and change that accompanied the First World War 100 years ago. The impact of World War I, political, economic, social, cultural, religious, is still felt in nearly every corner of the world and remains relevant to some of the most critical foreign policy challenges we face today. As Faulkner wrote, the past is not dead, it's not even past. The battles, protagonists, and settings of World War I live on. The tragic loss of a generation of youth in Europe, the Versailles Treaty, the Balfour Declaration, the end of the Ottoman Empire, the creation of modern Turkey, the Arab re Revolt, and so much more redrew the map of the entire Middle East as just one consequence of World War I. I can personally attest to this history's continued re uh, relevance when I was going through my confirmation hearings to be ambassador to Israel. The chairman of the, of the committee was uh, Senator Pat Moynihan. And if any of you know, he was quite a character. He once visited us in Amman, and my wife, Francoise, stayed with us. We had a dinner with some Palestinian leaders. And my wife came, and she said, oh my god, uh, what happened to the scotch? And uh, <laughs> we had a bottle of scotch. And he said, what happened to the scotch? And I said, I think he drank it all. <laughs> and he did. He was, he, he was just a great guy. I, I loved him. He was wonderful. But he was chairing my confirmation hearing. And so he gets up there. And only as he can do in Washington, there are not many senators and congressmen who have the historic knowledge and depth. He goes, uh, Mr. Ambassador, would you kindly explain to this committee the relevance and the implications of the Treaty of Sev. Uh, and you know, this, to, you know, everyone had a puzzled look on their face, and thank God I knew about the Treaty of Sev. But my answer confirmed me, and I said, oh, I said, Mr. Chairman, there is no one in this city who can answer that question better than you. <laughs> and then I gave a flimsy answer to it, and he, but he was just beaming, and I, I, I knew that it was over. Um, but by studying this history of World War I, we not only explore the mechanisms of global change and the consequences of these events, but also look to draw lessons for the current foreign policy environment. I would like to recognize the Baker Institute's Director of Academic Affairs, Alan Mattiso, uh, who has been instrumental in connecting the Baker Institute's close relationship with Rice University's faculty and students over the years, and who's collaborated with Dr. Zaretsky at the University of Houston to organize tonight's event. I will now let Alan introduce our distinguished panel we have here for this evening. Alan. Panelists all want to stand up, so I'll have to stand up too. We are a public policy institute, and uh, we feature experts uh, who write papers on issues of public policy. But issues of public policy don't leap fully formed from the pages of the New York Times. They have causes, they have roots, and they have history, which means that um, history is never far from the minds of the people who work here, including Ambassador uh, Dirigian. Um, usually, what we do is we, we start with the present at the Baker Institute and we probe we probe the past for causes, and what we're going to do today is invert that process. We're going to begin with a past and probe it uh, 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 for its consequences. If you're here to hear about the, uh, the causes of the, of the First World War, you will, you will be disappointed to know that we don't know what the causes are. We know there are lots of causes, and we can, we can tell you what they are, but we can also tell you there's absolutely no consensus on that issue, and there is unlikely ever to be a, a consensus. 
But that should not lead to the nihilistic conclusion that we don't know anything about the war, or that the, the, um, the exercise of history is utterly futile. We do know, for example, the proximate causes of the war, and um, Professor Caldwell is going to go into this, but um, uh, the problem actually starts in the Balkans, and it started with the conflicting ambitions of the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Serbs. The Serbs were... Um, super nationalistic. They had ambitions for a greater Serbia. They wanted to include all the Balkan Serbs within um, in their state. And the Austrian, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire defied them by annexing Bosnia and Herzegovina with a large number of Serbs. And that led to severe tensions in, in the Balkans. Nonetheless, in 1914, uh, Archduke Ferdinand, who was in line to succeed Franz Joseph as the next emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, decided to pay a visit to Sarajevo. Uh, and he was warned that it was dangerous, that there was um, um, likely to be assassination plots. He goes there anyway. And he's on his way to a reception at the city hall when somebody on a bridge throws a bomb misses him, explodes, uh, explodes nearby, and uh, terrifies the, uh, the Archduke uh, and his, and his uh, consort. They go, they have the, the reception at the city hall. On the way back, they actually might have got out of Sarajevo alive, except for one of those strange accidents. The driver of the car took a wrong turn. And on the street where he found himself, there was a would-be assassin, uh, Gravillo uh, Princip, who thought he was in the wrong place because the, the uh, Archduke was supposed to be somewhere else. But he was in the right place. He pulls his gun. He shoots the two of them. Uh, they're dead by the end of the day. And the crisis commenced, which leads to this interesting speculation. If the driver had known the right route, would 20 million people have died? Which actually opens up the more serious issues of what the causes of the war were. Just a, a brief addendum. Serbian nationalism, of course, did not die when the Yugoslav state broke up and the Bosnians uh, decided to, uh, to secede. The Serbs in Bosnia and the Serbs in Serbia uh, didn't accept it, and there was a war that lasted more than three years and killed 110,000 people. In uh, 1914, pardon me, in 2014, the mayor of uh, Sarajevo decided to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the World War I, and he would make this an occasion of reconciliation. It would be an occasion <coughs> for peace. It would be an occasion to show the world a new Serbia, which would be, uh, and uh, Bosnia, which would be a, a nation of, um, of um, a multi-ethnic, multi-religious nation. It's two weeks they had of celebrations, banquets, and concerts. But one group decided not to celebrate with the rest of, of Bosnia. They were um, radical Serbs, radical nationalists, um, whose hero was, in fact, Gravillo Princip. They had turned his grave into a mausoleum. They had turned him into a martyr and a hero. And on September the 28th, 2014, they celebrated the life of the assassin uh, of the Archduke Ferdinand. So what you can, can conclude from that is that at least in Sarajevo, World War I is still alive. We're very fortunate today to have people on our program, historians, who are going to talk about the causes and consequences of World War I. They each have about 15 minutes. And anybody who could talk about that subject in 15 minutes has to be extraordinary. Fortunately, we're fortunate that, that, that we do have some extraordinary historians here.
The first of, of our panelists today will be Robert Zaretsky, who is a professor at the Honors College at the University of Houston. He is um, an authority on France and uh, European intellectual history. His interests are extremely broad. Just to mention his book since 2009, The Philosopher's Quarrel, Rousseau, Hume, and the Limits of Human Understanding, Albert Camus, Elements of a Life, France and Its Empire Since 1870. Uh, he had co-authors on that one. A Life Worth Living, Albert Camus and the Quest for Meaning, and a book which will come out uh, next March, Boswell's Enlightenment about Reason and Religion in the 18th Century. Interesting thing about Rob is uh, he is a scholar, and uh, he is actually an internationally known scholar on the subject of Camus. He's also an engaged intellectual. He is the um, book review editor and contributor uh, in, um, in history to the um, Los Angeles Review of Books. He writes a monthly column for the Jewish Daily Forward. He contributes to the New York Times, Foreign Policy, Chronicle of Higher Education, and other publications. So we are really very fortunate to have him on our program today. He's going to talk about the lessons of World War I. I just want to thank the Baker Institute for putting this together. Um, I simply made a suggestion to Ambassador Jurigian, and um, they took it and they ran with it. And um, here we are tonight, and uh, I'm grateful for that. Um, and thanks for being here as well. Um, it's a beautiful night tonight, and um, I think we'd all rather be outside than in this auditorium. But we'll try to make it worth your while. Can the past speak to the present? When we decided on the title for tonight's panel discussion, I recalled a famously cryptic remark made by Ludwig Wittgenstein in his book, Philosophical Investigations. He wrote, if a lion could talk, we couldn't understand it. Now, for reasons akin to Wittgenstein's claim, I think if the past could talk, we wouldn't understand it either. The past is too removed. It's too remote. It's a foreign country, as L.P. Hartley famously said, one whose inhabitants do things differently and who speak a different language. And so it's tempting to answer the question, can the past speak to the present, with a very firm no. It can't. It's all the more tempting because there's no such thing as the past. Instead, there are pasts beyond recounting, and beyond counting, and most of those pasts, in turn, are forever beyond recounting. Moreover, when we do recount past events, they no longer belong to the past. They have, in the telling, they have morphed into history. And as Michael Howard once observed, history as such does not exist. Instead, there are only historians and histories. And let me add that Michael Howard was no wild-eyed postmodern theorist. He was a very hard-nosed and very conservative military historian. But since I still have 15 minutes to talk, I have to, <laughs> I have to say something else. I can't sit down just yet. So what I want to do is suggest that there is a longer answer, a slightly different answer from that no that I just proposed. There's a qualified yes answer, I believe. It's not the past that speaks, but it's the interpreters, we the historians, who try to make it speak. Now, when we ask the question, can the past speak to the present, we need to specify which past and which present. Given the theme for tonight, let's take 1914 as our example. 
I guess that right now, we're all thinking of the same series of events. The events during the summer of 1914 that led to the First World War. Yet the events of June, July, and August of 1914 were not the beginning of the war. Instead, they were the beginning of the end to a story that had begun years before. But when exactly did it begin? Did it begin in 1903? with the assassination of King Alexander and Queen Draga of Serbia, which is where Christopher Clark in his recent book, The Sleepwalkers, begins his story? Or did it begin in the 1890s and Alfred von Schlieffen's plans for a war fought on two fronts by Germany? This is where Barbara Tuckman in her classic account, The Guns of August, begins her story. Or did it begin with the so-called German War Council of 1912, which is where Fritz Fischer, in his War of Illusions, begins his very controversial history? And does this mean we should forget 1892 and the Franco-Russian Entente, which is where George Kennan, diplomat then historian, begins his story about the First World War? Now, we could play this game, will the real past please stand up? We can play this all night, just as we could with the question, which present are we talking about? Just as it's crucial where a, histor where a historian chooses to start her story, so too is it crucial where she decides to end her story. And it goes without saying that these decisions are made by the historian's particular present, namely the way her own time and her own place have shaped the questions she poses to the past. How else to explain, for example, that European historians already in 1914 were writing histories of the war's beginnings, though the war itself had scarcely begun. French historians, German historians, British historians, each explained in all objectivity why their respective nations' participation was just. American historians mocked the way in which their peers in Europe had all fallen behind each of their governments. That is, until 1917, when the United States, led by an historian, also went to war. Quite suddenly, that same generation of American historians, many of whom were trained in Germany and were upholders of Leopold von Ranke's famous dictum to recreate the past as it really was. All of them concluded that what really happened, the past as it really was, in 1914, was uniquely the result of German warmongering. Now, this belief, as most of us know, was codified in Article 231 of the Treaty of Versailles. But a different interpretation began to crystallize during the interwar period. It was a consensual interpretation, one that portrayed the war as an accident. Rather than willed by any single nation, the war instead happened to all of the nations. Now, this interpretation held fast through World War II and then the Cold War period. In fact, it was frozen into place by the dictates of the Cold War. But then, in the 1960s, a German historian by the name of Fritz Fischer, reflecting the doubts, the disquiet of his post-war generation, he shattered this consensus the Fisher thesis claims a fatal continuity between the war aims of Nazi Germany and, and uh, Wilhelmine Germany. And with that thesis, Fisher for a time dethroned the accidental thesis for the origins of the First World War. But now, over the last couple of years, with the publication of Clark's The Sleepwalkers, the accidental thesis is again on the ascendant. And so it goes. 
Now, this is very cartoonish, the survey, but I think it suggests something important. Namely, the question, can 1914 speak to 2014? What it really means is, does this past, the First World War, offer lessons to us in the present? Now, it's very tempting for professional historians, since we're such an endangered species. It's tempting for us to say, yes, yes, it does offer lessons. As we all try to find our footing in this blood-dimmed tide of war and terrorism, history alone seems to offer us the heights we need in order to see clearly, in order to orient ourselves. It's for this reason that so many commentators and pundits today parse our dire happenings through the so-called lessons of the First World War. And for good reason, there is something analgesic about analogies. They comfort. They explain the current wars in the Middle East and in East Europe by comparing them to the war to end all wars. But I think we need to be careful. All of us, I suspect, know that famous chestnut of George Santayana's. Those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it. But we forget that Santayana was a philosopher and a poet. He was not a practicing historian. In fact, is it not equally likely that those who do remember the past are doomed either to repeat it or to make equally appalling mistakes. Consider the actions of the European leaders during the summer of 1914. They were persuaded that the July crisis of that year sparked by the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand that this crisis was no different than the earlier crises that had traversed the continent, from Morocco to the Balkans, and that all of these crises had been surmounted by European diplomacy. They had been resolved peacefully or contained locally. And it was this past, marked by diplomatic scrambling and muddling through, that political leaders in Europe remembered in 1914. 20 million casualties, immeasurable horrors and hardship later, the world learned its lesson. We learn from past mistakes only to make new ones. Or take the recent US, USA Today survey that I came across that asked various public figures, including diplomats, what the lessons what lessons were learned from World War I. The three conclusions they offered were, and I quote, exhaust diplomacy before you use force. Two, war is always unpredictable. And three, history should be remembered. Rarely have lessons been so terribly trite, so demonstrably false, or both. Doesn't World War II remind us of the costs of exhausting diplomacy before using force? Do we really need a war when most of us already know this from family vacations that the best laid plans always go awry? Isn't it redundant to urge us to remember history when history, unlike the past, is already a form of remembering? Now, maybe I'm being too severe. So let me test myself. And we can turn to perhaps the most famous example of learning from the past in order to avoid catastrophe in the present. And this is the case of John Kennedy, Barbara Tuckman, and the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. In their book, Thinking in Time, The Uses of History for Decision Makers, by Ernest May and Richard Neustadt, this case is presented as their crown jewel. It doesn't get better than the Cuban Missile Crisis about learning from the past in order to resolve a current crisis. 
Now, as some of you already know, John Kennedy was a history major at Harvard. Um, it was at Harvard that he took classes where he studied the origins of the First World War as well as the Second World War. More important for our purposes, in 1962, just a few months before the Cuban Missile Crisis that October, John Kennedy read The Guns of August, the just published book by another Harvard undergraduate, Barbara Tuckman. Deeply, deeply impressed by this book, Kennedy ordered that copies of the book be made available to all officers, military officers. And he urged them, in fact, when the books were distributed, um, um, the officers were told that their commander in chief urged them to read this book. Now, we don't know how many in fact, did read the book, but I think it's a very safe bet to say that Curtis LeMay, who was the Air Force Secretary at the time, did not read the book. <laughs> now, at the height of the crisis, John Kennedy told his brother Robert, quote, I am not going to follow a course which will allow anyone to write a comparable book about this time called The Missiles of October. Other aides and advisors recall that Kennedy often cited Tuckman's book. He especially liked Tuckman's quoting of Chancellor Bettmann Hollweg of Germany, who when asked how the war happened, replied, ah, if only I knew. Now for Tuckman, the war resulted from miscalculations and misperceptions on all sides as well as from the pressure applied by military leaders, French and British, and French and Russian, no less than German and Austrian, the pressure that these military leaders placed on civilian leaders, all of them foretelling disaster if mobilization plans were not followed to the letter. But what's odd about the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 in many ways, um, what's odd about the Missile Crisis of 62 is that in many ways, it did not resemble the July Crisis of 1914. Let me just mention the greatest difference. Whereas the July Crisis of 1914 involved two alliances at odds not only with one another, but also doubtful of the loyalty of their alliance partners. The October crisis was a crisis between two nations. Nations, moreover, endowed not with dreadnoughts and machine guns, but with ICBMs and atomic warheads. Now, Tuckman would be the first to say she did not offer an explicit lesson in the guns of August. In fact, she was to do that much later and to much less effect in her book, The March of Folly. Instead, she offered a story, a story in which discernment and prudence were sorely lacking on all sides. It's telling, I think, that Kennedy told his brother Robert Kennedy and Ted Sorensen that the guns of August had taught him that the greatest danger a political leader can run in times of crisis was, and I quote, to make a mistake in judgment. Now, by judgment, I understand, and I think John F. Kennedy understood it in a sense too. I understand our capacity as human beings to draw fully on perception emotion, and reason to respond to new situations in all of their specificity. In fact, what Aristotle in his Nicomachean Ethics calls proper judgment is what I think President Obama meant when he warned us, don't do stupid stuff. It really is the same. Now here's my judgment of this particular historical episode the Cuban Missile Crisis of 62. Bullet points and disinterested analysis are very thin beer for moral and political judgment. Instead, 
political judgment, moral judgment, requires the thickness of experience, both one's own experience as well as the experience of others distilled through narrative. What Tuckman offered Kennedy in October of 1962 was a marvelously compelling story, one through which Kennedy could reflect on the, action, on the actions of Europe's leaders in 1914, which deepened, which sharpened his own capacity for judgment. The guns of August for Kennedy was less thinking through time than thinking through narrative. It was less the way in which Tuckman presented the facts from archival documents and published sources. Instead, it was the way she represented them in her own present, and this captured Kennedy's attention. Now let me end by repeating what I first claimed. The past does not offer lessons. It does not speak to us. But as Tuckman's impact on Kennedy suggests, the past does offer the material for narratives, stories, that when done well, place us in the skins and in the minds of others. And this is a necessary precondition for the exercise of mature judgment. Tuckman provided the story for John Kennedy and one that helped form a judgment that saved us from a war in 1962 that would truly have been the end of all wars. Now, historians do not have predictive powers, but we do have narrative powers, at least when we decide to use them. Our stories about the past limb, the many and complex paths we took to become who we are today. Is it possible, had decision makers in the Bush administration a better grasp of the history of Iraq, born in the rubble of World War I? If they had a better grasp, would they have chosen to make war there in 2003? Or had the Obama administration or the European Union better appreciated the deeply enmeshed ties, histories of Russia and Ukraine? Ukrainian citizens would have been spared the recent bloodletting in East Ukraine. Perhaps most important, stories teach us these stories, I'm, I'm sorry, teach us the most important, but what is no doubt the most elusive of all lessons, that no society in 1914 or in two, uh, 2014, no matter how much it believes its future is secure, is exempt from disaster, and that no matter how exceptional it thinks its nation's destiny is, no destiny is forever. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Rob. Our next uh, speaker is um, Carl Caldwell, who uh, received his PhD in um, uh, 1993 from Cornell University and um, has taught here for about uh, 20 years. Uh, he is a historian of Germany. He's a historian of European intellectual history. He has um, uh, written three books. Uh, his first, Popular Sovereignty and the Crisis of German Constitutional Law, The Theory and Practice of Weimar Constitutionalism. He likes long titles. Second, 1997, uh, Dictatorship state planning and social theory in German Democratic, in the German Democratic <coughs> Republic, and 2009, Love, Death, and Revolution in Central Europe. I actually cut down the title of that one. Uh, Carl is, um, in my mind, an exemplary Rice faculty member, and I've been here a long time and seen a lot of faculty members. Uh, he is, um, a very respected uh, scholar. He is an outstanding teacher, and uh, his service uh, to the university is really extraordinary. He, he just uh, finished two years as Speaker of the Faculty Senate. Whatever needs to be done, 
uh, Carl will do, and he, he does very well. And, and uh, so far as I'm concerned, the best part of it is uh, he's a friend of mine. So uh, Carl will also talk about the lessons of World War I. Thanks, Alan. Uh, thanks for cutting short the title of the third book, because in fact, that second half I didn't write. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the press did. Well, uh, it's a long story. I mean, you can't even write the title of your books anymore. Right? The other, I got to apologize because I'm afraid we're all going to be skeptics here, which leads us to question what historians are doing. But uh, Rob did that, so I'll try and do something a little different. Our panel discussion today asks about what lessons we might learn from the origins of World War I, but history, as we've heard, seldom offers lessons. It offers complex circumstances and unforeseen outcomes. Historical actors are only ever partly aware of what's going on around them. Often, maybe usually, they're surprised by outcomes. If we abstract from the specifics of an event to find a general lesson, right? to try and utter a scientific verdict about the causes of war, we risk losing the real dilemmas that historical actors actually face. In other words, the search for the lesson can actually obscure the history. Now, these two, the two great European wars of the 20th century seem in this connection to offer two big and general lessons about the origins of war. 1914 seems to offer a lesson, as Rob noted, about what happens when diplomacy fails and military planning takes over. One must keep diplomacy open to preserve the peace, right? When alliances are activated, when military plans are activated, then all the good intentions of diplomats become useless with horrendous outcomes. 1938, however, seems to offer the opposite lesson. Diplomatic efforts to maintain the peace at all costs can lead to disastrous consequences. I start with a set of contradictory lessons to make a point. Underneath these lessons, there's also an interpretation of the event itself, also the interpretation now. What is the event now that we're comparing to the past? To declare, as some of our politicians have, that the situation in Syria today is like 1938 is to make an assumption that something in Syria is like Nazi Germany. I'm not sure what, whether it's Assad's regime or whether it's ISIS. To declare that events in the Ukraine are like the events in Serbia before World War I suggests perhaps that to avoid a war, Putin needs to be appeased, really? In both cases, the complexity makes it very hard to make a clear judgment on the case at hand. I'm going to argue today the same may be said about World War I. The lesson that we draw from it presumes a clear interpretation of the evidence, but the evidence is, in fact, today not so clear. Let's we'll start at a more general level. The huge amount of scholarly work on World War I, we're talking 25,000 plus scholarly volumes and I don't know how many tens of thousands of not scholarly volumes. The huge amount of work has made it difficult simply to assume that alliances and military necessity led to war in 1914. This general lesson, which my students regularly bring to the classroom, except for the three who are here tonight, uh, <laughs> the lesson that the alliance itself is a cause of war, uh, we continue to hear that um, whenever we talk to people in the United States. I think it still remains very, very powerful. Was the alliance system a cause in itself? As Rob said, it served not only a little bit, it served for four decades to keep the peace in two different ways. It deterred opponents and it restrained allies. And that's what an alliance system actually does. A, whole, a number of very important new studies have made this point very clearly. If the alliance system can both first deter and restrain and, second, and thereby keep the peace and second cause the war, well, which is it? This general level, we're not getting anywhere. So I think we have to leave the general level behind and move to a more specific level. So that's what I would like to do next, to look at some specific lessons. I want to look at lessons for two countries in particular, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the German Empire. Let's say that both had survived World War I, and they don't. Neither one of them survives World War I. What would we say to their leaders about what they did wrong and about the crisis next time? Begin with Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary played a preponderant role in starting the war with its leadership's decision to, go to invade Serbia. So it makes sense to look at why the leadership made this choice. It was a clear choice for some. The crisis had been building for years. Serbia had become a force to contend with, especially after the coup of 1903. When Austria-Hungary decided to formally annex Bosnia in 1908, Serbia was the loudest complainant because of the number of ethnic Serbs living in Bosnia. Chief of Staff Konrad in the Austro-Hungarian Empire 
one of Joe's favorite people. We'll hear about that. Uh, had from this point on saw an excuse to attack Serbia. He wanted, a, 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 in other words, a, a preventive war already from 1908 on. In 1912, he said a full-scale European war was worth a gamble even if Austria-Hungary uh, uh, went down in the effort. In 1913, he pushed his government to go to war with Serbia when Serbia was talking about a possible land bridge to the Adriatic. In 1913, Germany abandoned its ally and said, don't do it. They stopped Austria from, uh, uh, Austria-Hungary from taking this step. Why was Conrad so pessimistic? Because Austria-Hungary was, as its leadership well knew, an increasingly unwieldy state, a state with multiple linguistic and ethnic groups that were at odds. These groups had already completely paralyzed the parliament in the Austrian part of, Austro of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. You don't have a similar parliament in the Hungarian part. Serbia, which claimed to represent all the Serbo-Croatian population, including that large part in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Serbia threatened the existence of the state. So, war, right? Well, how was the war actually supposed to shore up the state? Maybe because people would be more patriotic, but no government that went to war in 1914 was convinced two weeks before war started that everyone would necessarily be patriotic. Especially if you're looking at a multi-ethnic state like Austria, that would be a gamble. The difficulties get a little worse when we move a little bit closer. What were Austria-Hungary's Austria war aims? This is really important when you go to war to have a notion of what you're aiming to do, right? In its memo to Germany in early July 1914, the leadership said it aimed to, quote, push Serbia aside. I don't know exactly what that means. Moving the land, you know, it's unclear, right? Uh, presumably to destroy its army and isolate it from its neighbors, maybe reduce it in size, maybe eliminate Serbia entirely, give it to its neighbors. Certainly not, though. They agreed, do not annex Serbia. We don't need more Serbians. After all, it was uh, Bosnian Serbs who carried out the assassination. Are these coherent aims? I actually would say no. Start with annexations. They claim they're not aiming at annexations, but they never actually will come out and say, we renounce annexations. Because some of the military leadership says, well, maybe a few. So which aims would be necessary for reasons of state? Unclear. Would it make sense, for example, to divide Serbia up and let Bulgaria and Romania take them over? Those would be the most likely choices. Well, Romania had a huge Romanian population living in Hungary. Romanian nationalism also posed a possible threat to the empire's existence. That doesn't sound like a good idea. If Bulgaria took over, well, Bulgaria right now, they're kind of on uh, the side of Austria, but they had been close to Russia before. I don't see the crisis necessarily going away. To create a vassal state out of Serbia, how does not, that not simply replicate the problems of annexation? In fact, I'd argue the Austro-Hungarian Empire went to war without a clear idea of what would be accomplished. And they assumed that their military, which had very little experience in recent decades, would quickly win against an army that had been hardened in the horrible ethnic wars that had been going on in the Balkan Peninsula. The German ambassador to London called the entire thing a mere adventure and asked, how can military action and the threat of Serbo-Croatian nationalism. Even worse, the Austrian military leadership assumed or wanted to assume that Russia wouldn't be involved. They thought Germany would deter Russia. Austria completely misread what the Russians were saying. They stated very clearly, a crisis is developing. They suggested a diplomatic resolution. And the Austrians assumed, oh, they want a diplomatic resolution. That means they're not really going to go to war. Anyone who could listen carefully understood their deeper concerns, that Austria-Hungary Hungary really aimed to expand influence on the Balkan Peninsula and influence over the area around the Black Sea. Remember, it had just been a few years since they had annexed Bosnia. Russia's interests would be directly threatened, and that German ambassador saw this clearly. Nonetheless, Field Marshal Conrad of the Austro-Hungarian Empire assumed war would be limited. Although he kept saying a big war would be fine, he planned for a little war. The military adventure was a disaster. Austria had to shift from planning to crisis, crisis management almost immediately, so immediately, 
as Russia mobilized. In essence, Adam may disagree with me, but the Serbs actually won the war in fall 1914. It's only German troops and German management that reversed the few months of disaster. What are the lessons here? You're talking to a declining empire. Well, be careful about going to war. That's very trite. I think you'd agree, Rob, right? Be careful. The consequences are unpredictable. The outcome can be worse. And most important, don't assume the best case scenario. Don't assume that Russia will not intervene. OK, that's Austria-Hungary. Let's ask further, though, why did they take the action they did? Because Germany said it would be OK. We have to look to Germany. Germany was pushing the Austrians to war with Serbia. In Berlin, as in Vienna, there were military leaders pushing also out already this time for a preemptive war, for a wider war, fearing the declining place of Germany in the European balance of power. By giving Austria Germany its full support, Germany's leadership want pardon me, by giving Austria Hungary its full support, Germany's leadership wanted first to show that its main that it stood behind its main ally. Because of course a year before it hadn't. They didn't want to make uh, Austria-Hungary think they had a weak, uh, weak support from their ally. At first, the Kaiser and some of the civilian leadership thought that Russia would be easily deterred. This was a ridiculous assumption. Russia had been deterred in 1908. As the Chancellor at the time said, this is not going to happen again. You can't play the same trick again. By resolutely refusing to push Austria-Hungary to negotiate with Russia, Germany seemed to be insisting this conflict is merely local. But the result was to close off potential diplomatic resolution. So what happens? The Germans first do not only restrain their ally, but embolden it. Second, not only do not open up diplomatic channels, but close them down. We could find some lessons here. But only if we assume that the leadership wanted peace. And this is the difficulty. Some of the leaders, including the Kaiser, rush around in the final days trying to find a diplomatic resolution, although the Kaiser rushes around doing other things as well, occasionally crying. Uh, the military leadership, in particular Moltke, did not want a way out. They did not want a way out. They called for full mobilization even before Russia's position was clear. Full mobilization meant the Schlieffen Plan, it meant the invasion of Belgium. It meant the invasion of France. They seem to have viewed this war as necessary. They seem to have been willing consciously to risk a wide war with horrible consequences. A report from the military to the Kaiser from July 29th states that the war would, quote, annihilate for decades the civilization of almost all Europe, end quote. Quote, it would lead to the mutual butchery of the civilized nations of Europe. In other words, the military said very clearly, this is not going to be a short and easy war. They said it was going to be horrible, and they got what they asked for. This is the real difficulty that anyone who deals with the First World War has to confront. What if the leading elements of one power were consciously aiming for a wider war that would break apart the international order? In that case, how should the other powers respond? That's why. The discussion about the intentions of Germany and Austria matter today. That's why the argument continues. On the one hand, you have Christopher Clark and the apologists. Germany and Austria are engaging, according to his argument, in a rational response to a rogue state. That response only fails because they're not hard enough and because Austria doesn't act quickly enough to create a fait accompli. I don't think that Clark's argument is the same as his title about ghost walkers or but, uh, um, oh, uh, sleepwalkers. I don't think that's what he's really arguing. On the other side, their critics, Austria, Hungary, and Germany sought to break out of the international framework entirely, which is evidenced not only in their plans for war, not only the broad war aims that appeared in September of 1914, but also in the very way they carry out the war. And we're going, we're going to harden now, right? All the tales of propaganda during the war. But in fact, they began the war with mass atrocities in Belgium, and very soon, those turned to slave labor in Belgium and uh, starvation in Belgium. I'm led back to my original question. Was the correct response to Austria's decision to go to war with Serbia, backed by German leaders, conscious that the German war was likely, was the correct response to do everything to avoid the war, 
including letting the war with Serbia play itself out? And Russia would have the immediate cost, sure. But maybe also you would wait and Austria-Hungary would over the long term suffer from having an incoherent war plan? Maybe. That's one possibility. Or was the right answer to draw a line in the sand, as it were, to say, no, at this point a war will begin that will potentially destroy Europe. Well, I'm pointing out here, the policymakers at the time had actually a very hard decision to make. Very hard, and we have to keep that in mind when we're actually thinking about the actual moment of war. So what big lessons do we learn? What big lessons do we learn about avoiding conflict when good historians still can't decide what the ultimate intentions of Austria and Germany even were. Thank you. Our third panelist is uh, Adam Seid. Uh, he came down today from um, 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 Texas A&M where he's an associate professor and the director of graduate programs. He got his PhD from North Carolina in 2005, and since then he's written two books, uh, The Ordeal of Peace, Demobilization, and The Urban Experience in Britain and Germany, 1917 to 1921, and Strangers in the Wild Place, Refugees, Americans, and a German Town, 1945 to 1952. I, Looking this up, I, I decided I wanted to read this book. It sounds very fascinating. It's about a, a town, in, a small town in Bavaria that um, had a camp, a Nazi, tra a, a Nazi training camp in the 30s. It had a, a uh, forced labor camp in the same site during World War II. It was the largest displaced persons camp after World War II, and then it became an American military base until 1994. And the book apparently is about how these various peoples um, coexisted and uh, during um, these, uh, these tense times. It, it shows that um, Professor Seip is interested in, uh, in the human side uh, of history. So I'm looking forward to um, his talk, which will also be about the lessons um, of history, in this case, the lessons of three uh, people who experienced the war and became leaders uh, in the interwar period and drew upon what they thought were the lessons. So, Professor Seip. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, as to my last book, there are lots of copies still available. Um, and uh, I, would, I would echo his sentiment, you should read it and buy it. Um, Amazon, d deep discount. All right, anyway, um, <laughs> well, I want, I want to thank uh, all of you, first of all. I want to thank the Baker Institute. I want to thank uh, my distinguished colleagues on the panel. Uh, not only has it just been great to come down here uh, for the day, but it's been great to sit and have this wonderful conversation over the last hour or so uh, with, with you and with, with them. Uh, thank you very much for your hospitality. Um, and I will try, as, as Frederick the Great would say, to keep this short and lively. Um, uh, because I am well aware that I am part of what is keeping you. You weren't expecting Frederick the Great tonight. Um, that's, that's deep continuity. Um, uh, 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 I will. I am well aware that I am part of what is standing between you and refreshments. So, as the terms of the peace it was made in 1919 became public, there were critics on all sides assailing what was seen as a peace that was too hard or too soft, too Carthaginian, or too eager to put things back to some failed status quo antebellum. One of the most trenchant and poignant critics was Ferdinand Foch, recently the Allied military supremo, the man who had led the Allied armies to victory on the Western Front in 1918. <clears throat> Foch surveying the devastated landscape of Europe and surveying the peace that had been made said poignantly, this is not peace, but an armistice for 20 years. He happens to have been right. But I think in those words, words that we've actually heard a lot over the course of the last year as the centenary has come upon us, we can see some of, I think, a fundamental relationship that exists at the heart of the 20th century. 
many of us who are interested in the First World War, political scientists, international relations theorists, historians, scholars of literature, have been called upon over the last year to talk about what the war meant for the 20th century. And one of the themes that has emerged perhaps most clearly is that there were powerful institutional, military, diplomatic, and political linkages between the horrors of the war 1914 to 1918 and what was in some sense the far greater horror that Europe would emerge into in 1939 and come out of far more devastated in 1945. And appropriately enough, as we were trying to coordinate what we were going to say in, in some way to make this meaningful for you, as my colleagues have focused on some of the longer term lessons and have focused on some of the greater lessons that policymakers today might take, I want to concentrate on something slightly different. I want to talk on the, about the personal connections between the two great wars of the 20th century. What did those who participated in the First World War and later participated in the Second World War, what lessons did they derive from the experience of 1914 to 1918? And how did it shape, or not, events of two decades later when Foch's words proved to be prescient? And to do this, and I'll tell you what I'm going to argue in just a minute, but I want to set this up a little bit. I've really become interested in this remarkable age cohort of Europeans, and mostly we're talking about elites, though by no means all, born between the years 1870 and 1890. It was this cohort who would participate as adults. Mostly, of course, we're talking about men here. You could talk about women. There are certainly a number of remarkable women who fit into this group. But today, I'm talking about men who were adult participants in the First World War as low or mid-level political or military officials. And then 20 years later, because of the natural progress of careers, of age, of generation, held positions of national military or political authority in the Second World War. What lessons did they take from their experiences? 1914 to 1918. And briefly, I'm going to tell you who I'm going to talk about today, and then I'm going to tell you at least what I'm broadly going to argue here. The three figures I'm going to talk about, and I can do them no justice in the time uh, allowed. Uh, the three figures I'm going to talk about today are the French military commander Maurice Gamelin, born in 1872, someone who should need no introduction, German chancellor and war leader Adolf Hitler, born in 1889 and a lawyer turned politician turned president of Czechoslovakia, Edward Benesch, born in 1884. Men who were very much a part of this cohort, whose lives were scarred, whose lives were molded by the First World War, and who would have a chance to exercise, to put into practice the lessons they believed they had learned when Europe fell into a far greater catastrophe. And here I want to suggest in these three very brief examples that what we see here is a bright, flashing, cautionary tale about the so-called lessons of history. These were men who watched the same war from different vantage points and who derived completely different lessons from it. Those lessons were mutually contradictory and in some cases, those lessons would lead directly to state policies that in part because of what happened in the Second World War seem to us to be morally dubious or atrocious. It was the lessons of World War I as absorbed by this cohort that would help to fundamentally shape the far bloodier war of the 19th. 40s. I want to begin with the examples of Gamelin and Hitler because despite their difference in age and their very real difference in social status and a whole lot of other things, they learned their lessons on opposite sides of the same line, the Western Front as it snaked from the English Channel to the Swiss border. Maurice Gamelin was a member of the French elite 
and considerably older than Adolf Hitler. A brilliant young soldier, he rose quickly through the ranks and was, for much of the First World War, a senior aide, later aide de camp, to jo Joseph Joffre, one of the senior French commanders uh, for much of the war. Gamelin is an interesting figure because he would be influential long after the war. One of the French soldiers who had come through the war relatively unsullied, a major military intellectual, a teacher, a staff officer, and after 1935, the senior most officer in the French army. It would be he who would lead the French army onto the battlefield in 1940, and it was he who would see that army torn to pieces in the spring and early summer of that year. Gamelin, to say the least, gets a bad rap. He is the exemplar of what came to be, has come to be called the Maginot Line mentality. And boy, this is something when you teach European military history, and I teach it to the Aggies, and they are very interested in European military history. This is where you get the, why do they plant trees on the Champs-Élysées so the Germans can march in the shade, et cetera, et cetera. The Maginot Line is exhibit A for why the French should never fight wars unless they're commanded by Napoleon. Many of you know the story, at least the story as it is so often and wrongly told. The French, terrified by the bloodletting of World War I, built a line along the border with Germany, heavily fortified, designed to stop the Germans from ever seizing inviolable French soil again. But because they ran out of money and because they were afraid of offending the Belgians, they didn't extend it all the way to the English Channel because they thought the Germans can't drive tanks through the Ardennes Forest, and who's going to go through Belgium twice in 30 years? That's crazy. Here's the problem. It's wrong, and it's wrong on a number of levels. Yes, for people like Gamelin, the war, the First World War, had been this searing experience. But these were military men. These were people who were profoundly shaped by the First World War, but not in the way that we often think. They weren't afraid of war. They didn't want a war. But they didn't build the Maginot Line so the Germans would never come again. They may have told the people of France this, but privately Gamelin knew that you could build all the fortifications you want. The enemy would still come. And he said, as if to magically look forward to this talk and prove my point, he said in a private lecture in 1935, since 1915, wherever the necessary means are judiciously employed, one always breaks a front. For him, the Maginot Line was just waiting to be shattered should the Germans want it. But he didn't want them to. For Gamelin, if France was going to fight Germany again, they were going to learn the lesson of World War I, which was not don't fight the Germans. It was don't fight the Germans in eastern France. So where do you fight them? You fight them in Belgium. That's why you don't extend the Maginot Line to the Belgian border, because that's where you want the Germans to come. One of the great mysteries of the 1930s is why the Belgians could never seem to realize that the Germans were the greater threat. The honest answer to that is that the Belgians knew exactly what the French were doing. They were going to, as I like to tell my students, fight the, the French were going to fight the Germans with every last drop of Belgian blood. <laughs> the lesson was not don't fight. It was don't ever let the Germans into Eastern France again. Fight them, but fight them someplace else. This was a bad strategy and it didn't work, but it wasn't bad for the reasons we so often assume it was. Somewhere on the other side of the line during the First World War, away from the headquarters of the French staff, was a young non-commissioned officer an Austrian had found himself in Bavaria at the beginning of the war, Adolf Hitler. He would serve with some distinction, a frontline position for four years. He was, if nothing, personally brave, wounded several times at the end of the war, suffering from a gas attack. Hitler is, in some ways, it's very easy to see the lessons that Hitler derived because Hitler, unlike Gamelin, never stopped talking. And Hitler, helpfully for historians, never changed his mind about anything. If he learned a lesson, nothing would make him unlearn it. 
For Hitler, the lesson of the First World War was shockingly simple. The German army, the army he had served in, did not lose the war. They had been betrayed. Victorious in the field, they had been betrayed at home by Jews and social democrats and communists and the enemies of the state. This is a fundamental lesson that he took with him and carried with him apparently from when he returned to Munich in 1919 until his suicide in a bunker in Berlin in 1945. And from this lesson came two profound, profound consequences. There were actually more, but I want to talk about two very briefly. One, the internal enemy must be dealt with first. The result was an increasing police state, system of surveillance, concentration camps, the expulsion, destruction, or suppression of anything that looked like dissent and the beginning of what would become a racial war of annihilation. And second, and very pertinently to the people in this room, thinking about the United States, came a profound misunderstanding of the United States. Now, Hitler, there are lots of quotes from Hitler about the United States. He talked about the United States quite a bit. And I looked on Google today to see where. And so they're used for the NRA, the, you name it. You got Hitler quotes on the United States. He said a lot. Most famously, he called the United States a decayed society. He was convinced that the United States was, was potentially powerful, but racially mongrelized in his unfortunate formulation. But most profoundly, the lesson that Hitler took about the United States was that the American entry in the First World War had meant nothing. Because after all, it doesn't matter how many American troops were in Europe in 1918. The Germans hadn't lost the war. They'd been betrayed. The Americans had done very, very little to defeat Germany because Germany hadn't been defeated. This is the only way you can explain one of the most catastrophic and extraordinary things that Hitler ever did in his catastrophic and extraordinary reign as German chancellor. His decision on December 11th, 1941, to declare war on the United States, something he had no obligation to do whatsoever. He did it because he thought it came without cost. A lesson of the First World War directly applied to the Second, and something that Hitler would come to rue in the last desperate days of his empire. And finally, I want to turn our attention away from the abattoir of the Western Front and look to the actions, the stories, the, the, the lessons learned by a young Czech lawyer living who spent the First World War in Paris, where he was actively supported by allied governments who wanted to see his political movement succeed. Edvard Benesch is one of the most extraordinary and too often forgotten figures of Central Europe in the mid 20th century. One of the founding fathers of this extraordinary experiment that began in 1919, well, 1918 really, called Czechoslovakia, an unwieldy, unspellable, unpronounceable, consonant-laden name that even the, I, I, look at how many different ways it gets spelled just in 1919. It was a grand dream. It was a dream that European, that the ethnic groups that had divided Central Europe, that had been such a problem for the Austro-Hungarian Empire in its last years, might find some kind of political accommodation with each other. But Czechoslovakia, as many of you know, was born with a time bomb at its heart. More than three million ethnic Germans attached to Czechoslovakia simply because there was no political will to reward Germany or the new state of Austria in any way, shape, or form. The agitation of Sudeten nationals in the 1930s would be a major factor in contributing to the destruction of Czechoslovakia and the destruction of peace. Finally, after the shameful episode of the Munich Conference, Czechoslovakia would be dismembered and destroyed. Benesch is an incredibly complicated figure, a man who so deeply wanted to believe that Europe had a better, more liberal future, and who ultimately would have to flee into exile in London where he would spend the war. A man who had given his life to the dream of a cosmopolitan Central Europe, said as darkness fell on Europe one more time, national minorities are always 
and in Central Europe especially, a thorn in the side of independent nations. The result of that idea, as practiced by governments that came back from exile on the tails of the Red Army and of the Allied armies that swept from west to east across Europe, was the expulsion of three and a half million people of Czechoslovakian citizenship, at least in 1938. This would be repeated again in Poland. It would be repeated to some extent in Yugoslavia. It would be repeated up and down across East Central Europe. In the demographic catastrophe of the Second World War, which would make more than 30 million people homeless by its end, a story that I've written about in the book that Alan so helpfully mentioned a few minutes ago. It is here that we can most clearly see the pernicious, devastating, morally troubling way in which the lessons of 1914 to 1918 would be played out on a much larger stage, 1939 to 1945. If we want to understand the terrifying events that lie at the dark heart of Europe's 20th century, we have to look to the First World War much as we look to the Second, to look to a generation that was not just butchered, that was not just slaughtered, that was not just a lost generation. It was a generation that absorbed the lessons that it had been taught in Flanders, on the Isonzo River, in the fortresses in Galicia. A generation that absorbed those lessons all too well, even when those lessons were fundamentally opposed to the lessons learned by someone living across an international border. If we want to understand Europe's disaster in its fullness, we need to see that these two wars were fundamentally intertwined, dynamically, synthetically intertwined, and tell us much about the Europe and the world in which we all find ourselves today. Thank you very much. Doesn't matter. Look, you do your thing, though. For 10 minutes or so. Whatever. Okay. And then you call them, and you'll make a decision. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, you've heard the historians. <clears throat> we have a commentator, and we chose as a commentator not another PhD. Uh, we have a diplomat, because the subject, in part, is diplomacy. Uh, Joe Barnes um, graduated from Princeton and joined the Foreign Service. He served in Saudi Arabia, he served in Germany, he served in the Sudan and Sri Lanka, uh, and also uh, in Washington on the policy and planning uh, staff of the, of the State Department. So um, he's seen a bit of the world and he knows a lot about diplomacy, and even though he doesn't have a PhD in history, I'll tell you this, and I know him well, he knows at least as much history as any PhD in history that I know, and I know a fair number of them. Um, he's a Bonner Means Baker Fellow at, uh, at the Baker Institute. Um, his um, interests are international economics, geopolitics of energy, foreign, uh, foreign policy in general. Um, his, uh, his publications are very accessible to you. You just have to go on our website and read so, some of the papers of, of Joe Barnes. They are, they're worth reading. Uh, so he's our commentator today, and uh, I have no idea what he's going to say, but I have a feeling it'll be interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, uh, it's true I don't have a PhD. Please don't tell anyone. Uh, uh, at the, when I first came here, I would, would uh, uh, correct people when they referred to me as Dr. Barnes. But over the years, I've sort of, you know, decided I'll just let their error pass <laughs> out of the goodness of my heart. Anyway, I'm honored to be here today to respond to the presentations by these truly distinguished historians. Uh, I'm particularly taken, before I begin my comments, by uh, Dr. Uh, Zareski's remarks, that the, the question of when does this begin? When, when does this event begin? When does this, this, this moment of history begin? And when does it end, right? 
Uh, because if you look at the world today, if you look at the Ukraine, it's quite, you could quite plausibly say the Ukraine, what the crisis in the Ukraine, is a mopping up operation uh, at the end of uh, a century long struggle for mastery in Europe. The first armed portion of which ended in essentially an, an armistice and a stalemate. The second portion of which ended in the defeat of Germany. The third portion of which ended in the defeat of the Soviet Union. And now what we're seeing is the, the, the rump state of the Soviet Union, Russia, being stripped of its um, whatever satellites it has left in Europe. This is not to support Putin's views or anything like that, but just a thought. You know, World War I continues. Uh, Let me take the presentations one by one. I uh, found them all very interesting, and they give us a small taste, I think, of how complex and contentious this issue remains after a full century. Uh, Dr. Zaretsky uh, addresses broader questions of whether there are, in fact, lessons to be learned by history. I found his presentation to be fascinating. His answer, as I take it, is a sort of yes. Um, a no in the strict sense, which is that uh, we can't sort of find pat lessons in history. Uh, though we can perhaps use history uh, to, to gain what I would call uh, the sensibility of decision making, uh, qualities of prudence and attention. Uh, at the very least, by studying history, and this is, I would, this is what I take from your presentation, uh, we gain a sense, if not fully grasp, the imponderabilities of decision making, its complexities, its ambiguities, its potential, potentially terrible consequences. Uh, I might add here that the lessons of history, whether good or bad, <coughs> uh, informed or ill-informed, do not just inform decision making. Such, such lessons are routinely presented in, in, as arguments and therefore have an instrumental use uh, that may or may not uh, bear much relationship to the real reasons why the person presenting the argument wants the policy. In other words, <clears throat> people of, let's say, a particularly bellicose or warlike frame of mind when confronted with an American foreign policy issue uh, that deals with the United States confronting another state will just routinely, as a matter of course, cite 1938 as an example. So I just add that, that history is also something, a tool, and that can be used in a purely sort of instrumental sense. Uh, Dr. Caldwell takes takes a completely different approach to the issue. I think you call it a more traditional one, uh, <clears throat> specifically looking at sort of a, what I was, I was gonna call a narrow part of the question, but of course it's typical of World War I. The little narrow thing he's discussing, decision making in, in, uh, in Vienna and Berlin is the subject of this gigantic literature of its own. Uh, we haven't even got to Paris or, or London or, or um, Petersburg here. Uh, his argument, as I see it, are that both Germany and, the, and Austria Hungary were willing to take risks in retrospect, in retrospect, catastrophic risks uh, in the period uh, following the assassination of the Archduke. Uh, now, let's put Berlin aside for a moment, but in the case of Austria Hungary, I think. Dr. Kowal makes a good point that Russian, that Austria's goals were unclear at the beginning of the conflict and perhaps contradictory, which raises questions, interesting questions, which is what would drive such patently irrational, or such a patently irrational approach to such grave matters? And I presume, therefore, we have to move at that point into issues like personalities of the individual players, uh, cultural milieus, uh, uh, the general warlike, general militaristic culture of the period, for instance. 
Uh, once again, the, the problem, as we find all the time, at least from as an amateur point of view looking at this, is that it really is like an onion. You pull one layer, and then you pull another layer, and then you put another layer as you go down. Dr. Seif fo finally focuses on specific leaders in the interwar years. And uh, this discussion is fascinating in itself. I knew nothing about Gamelan in the interwar years, or much less Banesh. Uh, but his discussion reminds us that drawing on the lessons of history in itself can create history. In this, the, in this case, the course is taken by France and Czechoslovakia and Germany between the wars. And so history in this, in, in this sort of analysis, at least in part, is driven, it sort of becomes a cascade of historical lessons that, that, that pass on from one generation to the next. And those historical lessons can be good or bad, inaccurate. They can be insane, as in the, as in the case of Hitler, which brings me to a final observation before we, I think we might have time for a question or two. Something uh, Dr. Zareski mentioned, we were talking about before, which is about, which is that <clears throat> to discuss the origins of the, of the First World War is, is to remind us of the tragic in human life. Uh, that we are very limited creatures, um, prey to delusions of omniscience and omnipotence, uh, pray to wishful thinking, uh, and pray to, to developing or, use, or assuming best case outcomes. Uh, there is a huge, tra a huge uh, tragic element, not just to the particulars of World War I, uh, but to uh, international affairs in general. It's one we tend not to discuss much in the United States. Uh, we, are not, we are not people comfortable with the concept of tragedy. Uh, we are Whigs, every one of us, uh, waiting, for, waiting at, to play our part in this great triumphant march to, uh, to, this, uh, to this heaven at which that we will eventually arrive at. But I think World War I, and just as like World War II, and the events in the world today remind us of, of, of the limits, not just of history, uh, but of, of people. Thank you. OK, we have a few minutes for questions, uh, not as many minutes as we'd hoped, but um, feel free to ask one. Yes, sir. You, you mentioned, uh, uh, Dr. Sieb, that Hitler had experienced its First World War gas fail, mm -hmm. which was invented, of course, by the German Fritz Haber. And by the way, the Germans already in 1939 had nerve gases, Soman, Sarin, and Tabul. Mm -hmm. And the German army asked Hitler several times permission to use it in war, and he refused. He refused. And this could have been the real secret weapon that Hitler had. Because if the Germans have used nerve gases, the war would have changed. This is like using atom bombs. I have some personal experience with organic phosphates, and this is a dreadful thing. And it's amazing <coughs> that Hitler refused to do it in, even when he was desperate. I, 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 there's n nothing to add except uh, obviously I agree and and it, it is interesting uh, that one of the few instances in which gas was used in you know, on the battlefield between the wars is in Abyssinia uh, during the uh, Italian invasion which which really got desperate in a big hurry and this this is I mean one of the the, the many parts of, of the Second World War that I think Americans tend to get wrong is that Mussolini appears to be this sort of clownish figure who sort of follows along with Hitler and ends up hanging upside down from a gas station in Milan. Um, the, the, the Ethiopians did not see Mussolini as a, as a comic figure whatsoever. Uh, this was an incredibly brutal campaign. Um, so I, that's, I, the, that's, it's an excellent point, well taken. There is a book called A Higher Form of Killing that describes the whole history of chemical warfare was published maybe 20 or 30 years ago. Excellent book. Thank you. Yes, sir. So this is a what's question. Uh, if Germans had not lost the war <coughs> and uh, Ottoman Empire had not collapsed, and if Germans could control Middle East, 
uh, to Ottomans, how would the history be shaped and could we be having the issues we are having today? <laughs> well, what do, you t what do you guys please answer that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, um, Niall Ferguson, in a book that published, he, uh, a collection of essays that he published about 10 years ago called Virtual History, it's a series of what ifs. Mm -hmm. And he poses that very same question in the case of what if um, um, Great Britain did not enter the war in 1914 and allowed Germany to face, Fra Germany and, and Austro-Hungary to face France head on. Germany, of course, or the Triple um, Alliance would have won. And according to Ferguson's what if account, in fact, things would be very, things would not be terribly different today than the way they are today. In other words, he, he, he thinks that a German victory in 1914 would have led to a prosperous Germany that is running or is overseeing something that is very similar to the EU, um, is on fairly good terms with Great Britain, though Great Britain has this, 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 difficult relationship with whatever this EU passes for. Um, and so the question that Ferguson poses is, why did we have to um, spend 20 million lives in order to reach the very same result we would have reached if Great Britain hadn't gone to war? I think my German specialists may have issues with this. <laughs> I have you do too, actually. You have issues with it too. I, well, I, in my, I do have issues with it. We, talked about that before, yeah. but I've said enough. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, there's kind of the layman point of view that um, even if the Archduke hadn't been assassinated, the state of the alliance system, the Triple Entente and the um, Triple Alliance would have ensured war of some sort would have occurred eventually. What would you say to that? Carl? Is that a possibility? Yeah, I'm actually not convinced that the alliance system itself would have led to war. Um, I'm going to go back a little. You can see the alliance system working against war again and again. The question is what event is, can be seen as exploitable by different actors before the war? Now, I, so I shifted around to ask the question, if something, say 1914, the crisis had, not, had been resolved somehow, and there were ways, actually, right at the last minute where the crisis could have been resolved. Um, Austria could have occupied Belgrade and stopped. And that was one scenario. Uh, they could have bombarded Belgrade. I mean, there's a number of things that could have happened if one northern power had, had um, not pushed all the way. Now, the question is, would Germany or Austria, given the rate of rearmament in Russia and armament buildup in France, would they have felt as comfortable three or four years later? Adam can answer that better than I would, but I suspect not. I suspect that even though Moltke and Konrad, who had read their Schopenhauer very well, were deep pessimists, God, Schopenhauer had a horrible impact in Germany, right? <laughs> uh, it's his fault. Well, I, I think they at least saw they had a fighting chance in 1914. And I think that they saw if they waited, they wouldn't have the same chance. Now, that doesn't mean there wouldn't have been war for some other reason. I, you know, you, you can't predict these things. But you, you would have to ask about a scenario rather than the alliance system per se. It's also the case. Uh, what was Germany especially afraid of in summer of 1914? If they did not stand behind Austria-Hungary a second time, Austria-Hungary would find some other kind of relationship with the other great powers. Right? And so, yeah, then in other words, you might have a breakup of the alliance system and Germany would really feel, really feel encircled. If I, could, if I could just, and, and I want to stay out of the weeds on this because World War I historians tend to get even, even for historians, we're pedantic. But um, let, me, let me just stress, I mean, one of the really interesting things about 1914 is that war breaks out then. Why then and not before? I mean, why are all of the crises, you know, this is, it, it's like a baseball box score. You know, there's a couple of Balkan crises. There's the Daily Telegraph incident. There's the, the, there's the Moroccan crises, which are really silly. Um, but there are all of these moments at which things could go horribly wrong. And if Europe was sitting on the precipice, it would have. And, and where I, I, I think I, I absolutely agree with, with Dr. Caldwell, there's something fundamental that happens around 1912 and that is that both Germany and Russia, and there's a lot of debate as to who started it, 
sign or, or draft major military modernization bills. And the, the key date is that for the Russians, it's going to take until 1917. And the German general staff knows full well that if this modernization plan happens in 1917, the Russian army is going to be almost impossible to beat. And that terrifies the German general staff. And that, that's the window that Dr. Caldwell is talking about. Suddenly, the terms change. And it becomes an issue of if we're going, to, if we, Germany, are going to deal with this problem, the problem of Russia, it has to be between now and 1917. And that fundamentally shifts the dynamic within these institutions. It's, it's kind of inside baseball, but it's really important to, to, to keep this in context because, because it's a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts here. Anything else? Okay, last question. Oh, go ahead. Well, the Buddhist perspective to which I subscribe is that war, violence of this type, is always the result of greed, hate, and delusion, uh, which I think Mr. Barnes was trying to indicate in his remarks, which I thought. Oh, well, I'm not a Buddhist. <laughs> uh, and and and. The, and these remarks uh, here in this segment of the present, the presentation is terrific, first of all, thank you. Uh, it seems that at the heart, there, we, could, we could imagine where huge amounts of greed, hate, and delusion were, were uh, running rampant in each of these governments in their own ways. And I'm just wondering if you might respond to that. Please. No, 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 we just, we just, no, 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 you go, Both please. Both after Carl. Yeah. Carl. <laughs> Uh, greed, maybe. Um, delusion, absolutely. I think it's not just delusion, it's the willing, the, the willful refusal to consider exactly what military experts are saying is likely to happen. Namely, this is going to be a horrendous war. I gave you that quote from Moltke. It took a number of other people to say, oh, maybe this won't happen that way. Well, no, actually, there's a lot of indications it's going to be a horrific war. It's not going to be a short war. I think the short war illusion holds with the general population. It probably doesn't hold, at least with the military. At least that's what I'm seeing again and again. Again, others can correct me here. I think there's a willingness, however, to be optimistic where optimism is not warranted. Hate, we haven't talked about quite as much. And it's kind of odd, because uh, without popular acceptance of war, and I have a big pacifist movement at this time, much bigger than we have now, without willingness to say the Russians are barbarians, would the Social Democrats have gone over to the side of the war? Without the Russian deep hatred of the Germans, uh, I mean, in other words, I think that hatred plays, maybe it's not the immediate causal factor, but it's a background assumption that is extremely important for the actual coming of war. It's, a, it's amazing the transformation of public opinion um, in August of 1914. Um, I think the popular conception, the textbook conception of what takes place is that it's through um, institutional forms of propaganda that uh, the peoples of Great Britain and France and Germany um, are taught or it's impressed upon them about the otherness, the inhumanness of their opponents. But what's striking, in fact, is that much of this comes, it boils up from the ground. This, this, there's a great deal of popular sentiment that is unleashed by the war in August, um, and that uh, the <coughs> organs of the states um, across Europe didn't really have a lot of work to do in order to, 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 um, to fan these flames. They were already there. I would just add very briefly, I, I think that hate plays relatively little role, as my colleagues do, in the outbreak of the war, but it plays an extraordinary role in the persistence of the war. We have this idea 100 years on that World War I is this fratricidal conflict that was ultimately about an unpopular archduke being shot in the city most people had heard of at that point. However, combatant populations, even in states where the war was going very badly, were willing to go along, were often enthusiastic about going along for more than three years before there's real systemic resistance almost anywhere. I mean, it's astonishing the way that people self-mobilize for this war and that they stay mobilized. It's really depressing, frankly. Mm -hmm. And even that resistance come 1917, 
we need to qualify it. For example, the French mutinies of 1917, which affect half the French army, 54 <coughs> divisions. That resistance was not, um, th there was nothing at all defeatist about it. They wanted to continue to prosecute the war. They just didn't want to <coughs> can fodder any longer. They wanted their officers to find a better way to fight the war, but they were still determined to claw back that territory from the Bosch and to, um, and to um, show them what's what. You know, there's an interesting question here. We've been talking about World War I's beginning. When does World War I begin? It doesn't begin, actually, with the beginning of war. World War I, as the war begins, only some months later, maybe a half year later, when you have this kind of hatred, you have the long-term war, you have the restructuring of society, <coughs> then we're turning to the World War I where we're talking about. That's one of the stranger things about our whole discussion here. We're focusing on the early days, and yet the later days, we're dealing almost with a different war, which is what yes. you showed very well. Yes. Um, Dr. Carwell, you talked about like how Germany assumed that Russia will like back off in the war, right? Uh, but like I think that um, when Germany decided to invade Belgium, it is actually trying to prevent a two-front war because like it assumed that France is more like a bigger threat than Russia, so it has to like deal with France uh, first. So like in that case, Germany actually. Uh, have perfectly envisioned that how Russia involved in this war. So how do you explain that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, she agrees with Schlieff? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, the Germans make a series of assumptions. They even actually make an offer to the French before the war, right before. I can't remember the exact day. Maybe a week before the actual outbreak of war. Say, hey, look, we won't um, actually invade. All you got to do is let us go into Belgium, then let us go actually into France itself and take over some of your fortresses so that you have no defenses whatsoever, and then we'll be perfectly happy not to invade. That is, give up all, 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 of, the, um, all, all of the defenses, basically. So I mean, that's just an interesting thing to keep in mind as we're talking about this. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to answer the question. I think we're getting at the heart of the problem here, the relationship between France and Russia. And I actually would like to punt and hand it to Adam, <laughs> if you don't mind. Because uh, right. he's the military historian. Right. I do intellectual history. <laughs> all right, somebody owes me a drink. All right, um, <laughs> there, is a, there, is a, there is a case to be made. I mean, the, the, and I'm, I'm here, I'm quoting the great military historian Gerhard Weinberg. Who, who, uh, once sa who says in, in writing and, and in, when he taught that in any other society at any other time, the man who formed the German uh, campaign plan that would be applied in 1914, Graf Schlieffen, would have been institutionalized. But in Germany, he was made head of the Imperial General Staff. I mean, essentially, Germany's plan in the event of a general European crisis was to start the very war that it was trying to avoid. Um, the German nightmare was a two-front war. And so in this sort of, it is, it is a case study in how not to do civil military relations. Because you have, at some level, a civilian, quasi-civilian government that has every interest in containing a crisis that is turning over more or less complete responsibility to a military that, to use a cliche, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. They were told, avoid a two-front war. And for the military, that meant, well, win a two-front war. It, it is essentially taking, it is, it, it is it, yeah, I mean, it's taking, a, it's taking a, a necessity and turning it into a virtue. This is, in some ways, exactly the same challenge that Germany faces in World War II, and they botched that, too. Fortunately, um, so it's. I mean, it, it's an excellent question, and to get to the answer, I think we have to understand that, at least from my perspective, and, and Dr. Caldwell may have a very different idea on this. The, the Wilhelmine Imperial German state was deeply dysfunctional, and to some extent, we can say thank you for that because Europe wasn't contra Neil Ferguson dominated by Imperial Germany. We're in agreement. Okay, good. What, what he said. Okay. I'm. Um I'm a moment of indecision here because the panel is having a great time and the audience doesn't seem to be lurching toward the door and yet it's now 15 minutes past. Go ahead. In the first war, 
most of the civilian damage happened in France and Belgium, a little bit in East Prussia. <coughs> to what extent the fact that Germany itself didn't have civilian damage helped Hitler convince the German people that they betrayed and they didn't <coughs> lose the war? I would say, it's, I would say uh, that it starts well before Hitler. I mean, the first person to really, the first person to really promulgate what becomes the sort of stab in the back myth is Friedrich Ebert, who is, who is, you know, as far from Hitler politically as, as one can be. He's a social democrat and, and an enemy of the right, um, who, who tells the troops as they come back, you are, you are coming back from the field undefeated. It's an extraordinary line for an army that just collapsed in August of 1918. It is patent nonsense. However, it's patent nonsense that sells because very few German soldiers, you know, uh, there was very little fighting on German soil. Um, so it's, it's not just Hitler, it's a myth that begins very early, and by the time Hitler comes along, he's pushing on an open door with this. So it's a, it's a, it's a consensus opinion. It's also total and utter nonsense. I would say it even begins in 1916, 1917. There's a whole lot of discussion already then about how the numerous strikes and so on, which are happening in Germany, are attempts by people, by Jews and communists, to undermine the state. In 1916, there's a survey done, are Jews actually serving on the front? The results are never published, but it's, everyone's told the Jews are serving. We're going to investigate whether they're really serving. There's a development of an image of an inner enemy that starts very, very early. Okay, so that's the first part of this. The second part, you're absolutely right. You know, when the the French occupy the Rhineland, then suddenly you have all these remarks about the atrocities. I mean, it is horrible. The French actually do not do a nice job in the Rhineland. There's no question about it. If you compare that to what happened in Belgium with the forced labor and the brothels and the destruction and the hunger, actually the Rhineland doesn't look so bad. I'm not allowed to say that in some quarters. I'll get yelled at. But I think because there's not a standard of comparison, it becomes the great atrocity against Germany, the great atrocity of the 20th century that is also very central to Hitler's rhetoric. Thank you very much. Uh, the panel deserves a good round of applause. <laughs>